All right. So I would like to thank you first, uh, Thomas and also Hugues, for organizing this wonderful uh, day. And uh, I'm very honored to be part of this, uh, uh, of this amazing list of speakers. And, uh, and so, yeah, the title is, uh, uh, is a little bit ambitious. That's uh, uh, our project for maybe a 10-year, 15-year project. I don't know. To, to, to hope building a virtual embryo that would replicate, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, the, the development and help us to understand how uh, an early embryo develops. So these are uh, the objects we're interested in. And so this video, I'm going to show you uh, our nine different species uh, uh, and the first day of the development of the nine different species, which were collected at, uh, uh, at the Woods Hall at the Marine Biology Laboratory and, and filmed there by students. And, uh, and, and I wanted to show you this, to start with this uh, uh, video, because a little bit of lag, I'm sorry for that, to show you how much, uh, uh, to, to show several things. So the first thing we remark is the diversity, the diversity of shapes, uh, uh, the diversity of timings as well. Some embryos develop fast, some others uh, more slowly. Uh, some embryos have a, a so-called yolk cell, uh, some others uh, uh, don't, some have a cavity, etc. So among this diversity, it looks very uh, um, bizarre to think that we may uh, build a, a, a common model for all these, these species. But that's our goal, and, and I'll try to convince you that uh, maybe uh, it might be possible. The thing we might remark, though, which is common to all these embryos, at least at the very beginning, uh, is the shape of cells, uh, and, and uh, I'll mostly focus on that today. So, indeed, if we look at very early embryos, so the very, very uh, uh, first divisions, embryo look uh, uh, like this. These are beautiful structures. I'm always amazed by uh, these structures. Uh, but there are already complex structures with uh, broken symmetries, with axes uh, which uh, appear. And, and, uh, uh, and the question, uh, one big question in the field, is the early development a programmatic of a cell or a self-organized process? So I think it's a debate, and I tend to see this, uh, uh, this, um, this, the development of early embryos as a self-organized process uh, uh, in the sense that uh, it's through the interaction of cells uh, uh, that uh, an embryo develops. So it's really the interaction of the basic element of the structure which leads to its uh, development. Um, but on the other hand, the genetic regulation uh, is uh, constraining uh, the, um, the development and the shape of cells. And some embryo embryos, as I'm going to show you, uh, have very invariant and very reproducible uh, way of developing. And so uh, one, one, one thing uh, we might want to do is, is to extract the exact temporal sequence of biological events which happen in these systems. Uh, so if you start from the, 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 the right part of this embryo, uh, how, uh, what are the, the, the key mechanical and signaling events that led to uh, uh, the emergence of this specific structure and not another one. And I think one of the biggest challenges in, in that uh, respect is to infer the spatial temporal couplings between signaling and mechanics. We have a roughly, uh, uh, roughly good idea of uh, what is the mechanics, and I'm going to focus on that. Uh, we know uh, many of the signaling pathways uh, uh, which are involved in, in development, uh, WIND, uh, BMP, FGF, etc. But how are they coupled and how these couplings lead indeed to the emergence of a complex structure remains a, a, a big uh, question in the field. And finally, all biological systems are multiscale. And, and one question we might ask is how many temporal, spatial temporal scales we need to couple to really uh, get a good understanding. So how much details at the molecular level we need to keep to really get a good understanding of, uh, uh, of development on embryo. And I think, uh, <clears throat> apart from that, there is another question is that in biology, uh, most of the perturbation you can do are actually at the molecular level. So I think it's important for us in models to keep uh, 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 some details about the molecular level to be able to interpret uh, experiments uh, in a proper and quantitative way. And so here I show you a different perspective, uh, three embryos again, but here these are the three first uh, uh, the, sorry, the first 100 cells of these uh, embryos. And so uh, this first video is a, is a mouse embryo. It takes actually three days to reach uh, the final cell you're going to see, so about 100 uh, cells. And, and, and I like this system very much, not only because I worked on this for several years, but uh, because at the end you have only two to three cell fates. So only two to three possible cell behavior and cell mechanics. So it's, for me, it's a relatively simple system where you have three uh, uh, possible... Uh, uh, cell types, let's say. Um, the development of this embryo is known as regulative, meaning that each embryo will have a slightly different uh, uh, um, uh, shape, uh, and the number of cells inside, outside will be a little bit different, etc. 
And this is very slow, meaning that in terms of mechanics, you have time to relax and you can make a so-called quasi-static approximation where essentially dissipation will be largely negligible. Now I'll show you these other embryos. Oops, sorry. I think my, my computer is lagging, but it will come, um, <clears throat> which is an acid embryo. So it developed now in only four hours to reach uh, the same number of cells. And, and, and at 100 cells, you have already roughly 17 cell fates. So I think the, the one in the middle didn't work. And so already the, the complexity is much more, uh, much higher uh, to me. Uh, on the other hand, it's a very invariant system that you couldn't see, unfortunately, which means that uh, the, oh, yeah, it's coming, uh, which means that uh, each embryo has a, from one embryo to an embryo, and even here from one species to uh, another species uh, of uh, acidian embryos, uh, you get exactly the same cell position, the same cell shapes. And on the right is maybe an, an even more, more extreme of uh, this invariant development. And, and these embryos may develop much faster. You could see probably that in between each division, you had little time. So here, uh, the mechanical approximation of a quasi-static system starts to be uh, questionable. Um, yeah. So, and that's why, the, because of this invariance, that's why these, in these embryos, uh, so Siona, for example, and, and Siligans, you can name each uh, cell, uh, give it a name, because uh, indeed you can uh, identify them uh, reproducibly. And so, what is interesting here is to, 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 to see that the, the, the Siligans, which is a very uh, well studied system, is one uh, uh, easy system to study in biology for various reasons. In particular, the genetic perturbation is easy. Uh, uh, but for me, I think it is one of the most difficult because it's extremely dynamic and extremely diverse in terms of uh, possible cell fate and social behaviors. Whereas uh, the mouse embryos, which is much harder to study uh, experimentally, is probably much simpler to uh, start with. So here are a list of basic ingredients, which I think are necessary. It's maybe not a, an exhaustive list uh, of course, uh, what we would need to put as sort of functions or modules for these cells to, to, to be able to reproduce their development. So uh, an obvious one is cell division. And when I talk about cell division, I need to be able to understand how uh, uh, division is oriented, uh, if there may, may be asymmetric divisions, and what is controlling the, day, the timing of division. And I show you uh, as an example, sorry, uh, this beautiful paper of uh, uh, the lab of Nicolas Menck, where they could see, they could show how the, the orientation of division only could really, really reproduce the patterns of uh, a certain number of uh, embryos like fish, amphibian, etc. Then cells may deform, uh, and they, so in particular, a compaction, so the increase of cell cell contacts is something very common among embryos. Uh, cell might enter the, uh, the embryo, so internalize, that's what we studied uh, uh, a few years back. Cell may intercalate, etc. You have, of course, biochemical interactions, so cell communicate. So there is this recent and beautiful paper by uh, the group of Patrick Lemaire. Uh, where they showed that the geometry of uh, cells, in particular the size of their contact, is uh, uh, controlling essentially uh, the amount of ligand that uh, one cell receives from the other and uh, the fate specification. You have cell polarization, etc., zygotic transcription, and regulatory networks. And as I was mentioning before, and I think uh, uh, that uh, Edouard will talk more about that, uh, Edouard Hanzo, is uh, the cross talk between these different uh, uh, functions of cells. So feedback loops, the possibility to, to, to sense mechanics uh, and, uh, and, and to tune your mechanics depending on uh, the fate that you take. So the goal is to try to put all of that into a single virtual embryo. Uh, it's relatively ambitious. Uh, and, and so one idea is to see the cell as a tech and engineering approach a little bit and to see the cell as a, as a machine. So I took this, uh, this nice picture from a recent book by Mike Sheets. And, uh, and, and, and somehow the way I see a cell uh, uh, or I hope I can, I, we can model a cell, is, is uh, some sort of dynamical system which receives inputs, so uh, some cues, which can be geometry, uh, some ligands, some mechanical strain, or maybe even an electrical potential, and, and will essentially couple of that to, uh, uh, to lead to some behavior, to some function, which will be, uh, okay, let's divide, let's create some force, uh, let's polarize, etc. It has also its own cloak and can have uh, cell autonomous uh, uh, behaviors. And somehow what I want to... Uh, put in a black box is all these gene regulatory networks, which are of course important and will be important to perturb the system, but might not be so important to model specifically to really understand how these different uh, things couple and to understand self-organization as a whole. So <clears throat> one question I ask is, can we infer uh, uh, from the data we have a sort of system level regulatory network 
uh, and so uh, one way would be to see the, the, the embryo as a graph, a graph of interaction between uh, uh, cells, and, and each of these cells is some sort of uh, uh, microprocessor, and we will try to train these microprocessors based on uh, available data, in particular imaging. So <clears throat> now I'm going to show you a bit uh, the building blocks we've, we've been working on. So I, I love Lego, so I found this, uh, this, <laughs> this nice picture where you could see there are different parts. You can build each part independently, and then you try to put it all together to form a, 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 a system uh, uh, that has... Uh, um, that has multiple functions. And I cited, so this is my, my quote, huh? everybody has given a talk, a quote today, uh, taken from the famous Darcy Thompson, who said that the morphologist is ipso facto a student of physical science. So as soon as I think as you study morphology, uh, you have to uh, study math, you have to study physics, uh, and, and, uh, and so this is what we do. And he was one of the first to, to, to make uh, analogies and to say that there, there is a continuum in biology. It's not, um, um, we, we, it's, it's important to classify things, but uh, the biology is some sort of continuum. And in particular, he was interested uh, in, uh, in what shape cells, and he made this analogy uh, between uh, embryos, tissues, and uh, forms. And this is essentially the analogy I'm going to uh, do today. And so there are two things uh, you can say in terms of mechanics if you do this analogy. The first one is that if a cell is like a bubble, then it has a surface tension, which is uh, an energy per unit surface, which will tend to minimize its surface. And so the, the law associated to it is a so-called Laplace's law, which relates the difference of pressure between inside and outside, the tension, and the radius of curvature. If you put two cells or two bubbles together, then you have a, a second law of uh, uh, mechanics, which is a young dupre which just tells you that at junctions, the, the, the tension have to balance each other. And from that, you'll see we, we'll, we'll get a lot of things. So here are the, just a, a very rapid overview of the things we do, a little bit more complicated. So we can, uh, I also love triangles, uh, like Rob Phillips, and, uh, and so we do some finite element uh, modeling of uh, cell deformations. Hope it's coming, sorry. Uh, uh, for example, of an osmotic shock and a relaxation of the actomerizing cortex or cell division. I'm sorry, I have some issues with that. So we, we try to, to put all of that into a multicellular uh, uh, level uh, to try to understand really how that couples, uh, for example, with the shell. If you remove the shell of this uh, C. elegans embryo, you see that the shape is very different. Uh, uh, and we try to understand uh, how what controls the volume, what controls the transport of ions and, 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 and water uh, 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 through uh, uh, these cells. And I'm going to show you that uh, a little bit later. On the other hand, you need to be able to compare your model with data. And I think this is very important, and we don't do that enough in a, in a very uh, specific or very, um, it's an extremely precise way, and we want to, to really try to, to, to get as close as possible to the data. So these are uh, classical methods that one may use to measure mechanics, uh, in particular surface tension, so micropipette aspiration and, and IFM cell compression. But one can also uh, try to use a, a non-invasive methods, so methods which don't uh, uh, perturb the system per se, and so, uh, for example, you can try to segment uh, these embryos uh, with meshes to uh, extract uh, geometrical parameters, or even assume a model and infer what would be the parameters of the model that would give the same uh, shape, which is called mechanical inference. And the uh, uh, last thing we do is to try to create artificial images, first to test our uh, models, our uh, analysis methods, but also to train so-called uh, neural networks or, or deep learning uh, algorithm to, to help us uh, analyze a lot of data. So, this was a short overview, and now I want to apply a little bit what I'm going to have said to a specific uh, problem, uh, which is uh, how to form the first biological cavity. So many embryos, not all, of course, uh, have a, a so-called blastocele, which is the first cavity that appears in development, and which uh, interested us uh, with uh, Mathieu uh, leverge serrandour who is the first PhD student of the lab. And uh, the, the classical way it was described, uh, which uh, comes from a, a paper by uh, Lewis Wolpert, is that cells uh, will tend to divide in a, uh, 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 in a circumferential way, such that uh, the, 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 the circumference or the, the diameter of the cell will increase, uh, leading to uh, uh, the formation of a cavity, and then the, the, the cells will seal and, uh, and the, the, the water will stay inside. So this is the classical uh, way of seeing uh, uh, the formation of a cavity, and it, it probably it is what happens uh, in several uh, species, but when we looked a little bit at, uh, at uh, um, what we could find in literature, we could find actually a large variety of different uh, mechanisms for the formation of a blastocele. So in Exonopus, uh, it's described as uh, the secretion of vesicles and ions 
that will be pumped and, and by osmotic imbalance will uh, create a flow of water inside. Um, in a mouse, this is what I'm going to spend uh, the, the next uh, minutes on, so I'm not going to detail here. And marsupials, uh, something very original, the cells tend to adhere to a shell which is surrounding the, the, the embryo. And, uh, and then they will spread and divide along this shell until they, they indeed make a confluent uh, tissue. So this, just to show you that uh, there is again a large diversity of, uh, of mechanism, but when you look at the physical processes involved, they are m almost all the same. There is adhesion, there is cortical tension, there is uh, uh, the control of volume through osmotic gradients, uh, and, uh, and I think that's more or less uh, or in cell divisions, in the pattern in cell division. So playing with that, uh, we hope that maybe we could uh, indeed, uh, uh, with a single, what I mean is with a single model, I think we could uh, potentially cover all of these different mechanisms. So now I'm gonna specifically focus on the mouse embryo wh on which we've been working uh, uh, for several years in, in, in tight collaboration with Jean-Léon Maître, who now has his lab in Institut Curie. So we worked on, on so the, 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 the pre-implantation mouse embryo has several uh, morphogenetic steps, three in, in, in majority. So the first one is called compaction, which happens at eight cell stage and corresponds to an increase of the cell-cell contact, which compacts the embryo into a ball. Then some cells uh, need to end up inside to form what is called the inner cell mass, which will become the embryo proper. And that happens at 16 cell cells, and we describe that it could happen through inter active internalization of cells. And what I want to focus on is the so-called cavitation, so the formation of a cavity uh, from the 32 cell stage onward. So this was the work uh, of uh, Julien de Mortier, uh, postdoc at the time, in uh, uh, Jean-Léon Metz lab, and uh, Mathieu, uh, who is here in the, in, in the room. And so here I show you a video of this cavitation, uh, which is a maximum projection. Uh, of, uh, of the embryo, and the impression it will give, which was the impression people had, is that one cavity forms somewhere randomly and then grows, uh, and, and, and this was described as uh, uh, the result of an osmotic gradient. Okay? Why is it important to form a cavity, uh, and what are the characteristics? Uh, uh, the first thing is that it breaks the radial symmetry of the embryo, as you can see, and actually it will set the future uh, dorsal ventral axis. It creates an inner pressure, and this inner pressure will help actually the, the embryo to hatch. I'm going to show you uh, that on the human embryo a little bit later. Uh, and uh, I think that's all, that's already good. But when uh, Jean-Léon and Julien looked at this embryo, this is a section now inside the embryo, what they could remark is that, is in fact, there are bubbles, some sort of cavities, small cavities, which form at each contact. Maybe I could, sorry, don't look at this one, look at this video again. So we'll stop at some point, you will see that all contacts are broken into a myriad of uh, what we call macrolumens, so very small cavities, and then the question is how this macrolumen will end up into one single cavity, and how does that work? And so the physical analogy which came into my mind was uh, 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 relatively obvious, uh, is uh, that this is a coarsening process. And so uh, this was analogous to what is uh, the so-called Oswald ripening uh, process. So what is Oswald ripening is the fact that small bubbles uh, tend to empty themselves in big bubbles, or if you have an emulsion, that it will tend to uh, coarsen into two uh, separate phases. And this comes from, in fact, Laplace's law. This comes from surface tension. Uh, small bubbles have a higher pressure, they have a lower uh, radius of curvature, and uh, as you know, uh, uh, things like to flow from, small from high pressure to low pressure. And so in Oswald ripening, this goes through diffusion. The process of uh, transport is diffusion. And here, what we think is that this goes through flow. So this, uh, 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 <coughs> echoes to, uh, to uh, the, the, the beautiful, beautiful talk to, of Karen Alim, but uh, here what we believe is that essentially the small, uh, uh, the cavities are under pressure because of surface tension, and uh, they coarsen uh, uh, because of the difference of Laplace's law which emerges from that, okay? So this is uh, a very simple model we, we built out of that. So this is like a, an electrical network, a little bit like it was shown earlier. And so we have to, to solve for the so-called Kirchhoff laws, uh, so, so the conservation of mass, if you like. And you can relate the flux, uh, which is like a current in electricity, to the difference of potential, which is here a difference of pressure, and the resistance, uh, uh, which uh, is linked to the, 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 the size of the, 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 the tubes uh, between uh, these cavities. So you can run simulations on simple networks is an example of it. And, and what we uh, found from the simulation is a very simple signature of a coarsening process, which is the fact on the, on the bottom uh, left, right, is the fact that the, all the lumen will increase in size, the mean area of the lumen will, will, will increase until a certain point uh, uh, where uh, they will all shrink to the benefit of a single, of a single lumen, which will be the final uh, blastocyte. Okay, so there is this biphasic 
um, um, structure, and we could indeed, by measuring uh, the size of these cavities in the embryos, uh, recover this uh, biphasic uh, signature. <coughs> so then, uh, okay, this, this, this is nice, but uh, then we wonder, okay, but what does explain then the fact that the, the, the cavity is not inside, in the middle, but a little bit shifted uh, uh, inside the embryo? And, and then came into our mind the fact that the tension is probably not the same between the, the cells which are the, the trophic totem, so the external layer and the cell which are inside. And we knew that because we had proof that the internalization process came from a difference of tension. And indeed, if you now play on tension, you can reverse the direction of the flow, meaning that uh, essentially the flow will go where uh, the pressure is the lowest and the pressure can be lower because the tension is lower, not only because the, the, the cavity is bigger, okay? So you can reverse the direction of this flow and this is Experimentally, what uh, Jean Lyon uh, and uh, Julien did with a beautiful experiment where they mixed, they made camera, so they mixed different cells, so either white tap and white tap, and then the, the, the statistically the cavity forms uh, uh, with similar, uh, uh, um, sorry, probability at, uh, at the contact with blue and, uh, and um, magenta cells, but when you mix white tap cells and the same amount of uh, uh, cells which have been uh, genetically modified to remove one copy of myosin, which is responsible for this cortical tension, then you see that the, the cavity will form statistically uh, where uh, the, 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 the cells are more, uh, have less mechanical resistance, less tension, and so uh, uh, close to the green uh, region. And so that proves that indeed, by biasing mechanics, we, 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 by patterning mechanics, we can bias the position of the embryo. So <clears throat> just to mention that these, uh, uh, this uh, uh, so-called, so people call that uh, um, the bubble, uh, I don't remember actually how they call that, but uh, uh, essentially, if you take two, uh, two bubbles or if you take two balloons and you connect them together, you will see the same effect of one balloon emptying it into itself. And this is a process which was uh, seen uh, uh, also in other uh, developmental process, in particular in orogenesis. So Joseph Villar orogenesis with this very nice paper uh, from the lab of Adam Martin, where you see clearly these flows. And now these flows are between cells uh, through uh, so-called ring canals in the, um, in the gemarium. <clears throat> and explain why all the germ cells will empty themselves into the future, uh, 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 the future oocyte. And uh, another uh, case is that uh, this uh, the orogenesis or in silicons in a in a worm, where you have something a little bit more complicated, but uh, a similar uh, <coughs> a similar process of uh, small cells which empty themselves into uh, bigger cells. So now, okay, I've told you about flows and and. Um, and, uh, and hydrostatic pressures, but in fact, uh, these uh, cavities appear because there is osmotic pumping. And this is something I mentioned. If there is osmotic pumping, there are concentrations, and if there are concentrations, there are possibly uh, osmotic pressures as well. Uh, I mean, there is osmotic pressure, of course, but there could be gradients of osmotic pressure as well. And uh, in particular, you can have two uh, cavities with two different osmotic pressure with two different concentrations. And if there is, this is the case, then this can also drive a flow. Uh, toward uh, the, the, the cavity of higher concentration. So the question, the first question we had is, can we get, is there a competition between the two? And, and what is the most important in fact, osmotic or hydrostatic pressure in driving the flow? The second one thing which I know so far is the fact that the membrane is permeable. So in fact, the water can also escape on the way. So what, what, uh, has, uh, what has this as a consequence? And the, the last thing is that uh, there is pumping uh, and you could see that the cavity, in fact, increases in size, and, and we know also uh, this aspect. So the first, to answer the first uh, thing about uh, uh, osmotic versus hydrostatic pressures, uh, this is a diagram which shows you uh, uh, the direction, so the, the immediate direction uh, between one, uh, two cavities, depending on the pressure asymmetry in the x-axis and the concentration asymmetry in uh, y-axis. And the curve, the, the shape of the curve shows you that essentially uh, to reverse the the flow from, uh, uh, by changing the concentration, you need to reach extremely high asymmetries. So essentially, osmotic heterogeneity will not lead to uh, uh, big effects. Uh, we don't expect it to lead to big effects. The second thing is permeation. So here I show you two different cases, where one where there's no permeation uh, through the membrane, and one uh, tube where you have holes so the water can escape. And of course, if there are holes, then the pressure gradient can be lost on the way. And uh, you can quantify that with a certain length, which I, I call psi v. And this psi v has been quantified, actually, and, and, and predicted by a former uh, uh, paper by Jacques Pro, uh, and this is called a screening length. And we can define a screening number, which is the ratio of this length uh, with the length of the tube. And so if the length of the tube is, uh, is lower, um, then essentially uh, you have uh, the, the transmission of the pressure. If this is much higher, then the pressure is lost on the way. 
And this cooling number depends, as you might guess, uh, on the permeation of water and depends also on the resistance uh, of uh, hydraulic fluid. What is important is to compare numbers here uh, uh, instead of talking. And, and this number is the radius of the mass embryo and uh, this cooling length. And we see that these are uh, essentially at the same scale. So it means essentially two uh, uh, cavities which are far apart in the embryo will, will see each other in terms of pressure. So we're fine. The, the, the model we, we proposed earlier is relatively uh, uh, good. Uh, there is no pressure screening in the embryo. But if you, you fuse two or three or four embryos, maybe actually you could lead, uh, could lead to uh, two uh, different uh, cavities. So now, more, uh, more physically uh, speaking, if you start putting these cavities together and look at how they behave dynamically, what you observe is the so-called self-similarity or dynamic scaling. So what does that mean? That means that if you zoom out, uh, uh, um, if you wait a little bit in time and then zoom out, then essentially you see the same pattern. So it's like a, a fractal, but in time. And associated with these self-similar uh, processes in physics, you generally recover a so-called dynamic scaling law or exponent law. And this is exactly what we find. If you plot the number of uh, lumen or micro cavity as a function of time, you find a very uh, precise law, uh, which is uh, here for a, 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 a single, um, sorry, a line of uh, lumen, which will be minus uh, t to the minus two fifths. And if you extrapolate that uh, through uh, a mean field theory, you can expect in the embryo to find t to the minus three fourths. So we haven't yet measured that in embryo. We, want to, we need to come back to the, the previous data and, and, and quantify this. This is not easy. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, 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 this is a very strong signature actually here of the coarsening process. And the last thing we, we did with, um, with Mathieu on this uh, is to uh, look if uh, by biasing or patterning, especially the pumping, uh, could uh, also uh, 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 control the position of uh, the cavity. And so these are uh, theoretical graphs, but here I compare the red, which is a, a homogeneous pumping, and the green where you have a pumping which is higher in some region, which is not in the middle. And so when you, what you see is that if you have homogeneous pumping, you expect the embryo to be exactly in the middle. That's the, the, the distribution below. And if you shift, uh, the pumping, if you put more pumping somewhere, then uh, as you might expect, uh, this will uh, tend to bias the position of the embryo. And this is interesting because, in fact, the only cells we are, which are able to really pump uh, uh, continuously are the T cells because they can pump ions from outside. The cells which are inside, if they pump, if they ex expel their ions, they will just shrink, 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 and, 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 and disappear. And, and this is not what we see. So uh, uh, this is a possible uh, second explanation why the blastocell is between the T and ICM and not in the middle of the embryo and breaks the symmetry. So this is what I uh, uh, have explained you. And I think I will need to uh, uh, finish almost here. I had a few um, things to tell you about uh, what controls the size of a cavity, but I don't think I will have the time. Maybe just to introduce the, the questions here. And I show you for that uh, a human embryo. Uh, so here is a human embryo, and the human embryo or mouse embryo is actually surrounded by a so-called zona pellucida, which is an elastic shell. And uh, and you see that this elastic shell tend, tends to to limit the size of the the, the, the cavity. It also oscillates, and, and that's something which has been recently explained. Uh, but there is a pressure that that is created inside this embryo clearly, and at some point it will hatch. So creating this pressure is important to hatch. So one question, with, with basic question is, does can have a lumen or cavity have a stable volume? Uh, 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 these cavities tend, tend to grow and, and don't uh, seem to be uh, stable. They grow and grow and grow. Um, <clears throat> can mechanics limit the size of a cavity? What is the difference between an apico and, and a basal lumen? So, so some lumen or cavities can be can be can face the apico side of cells, and some other can face the basal side of cells, and that makes a, a difference. And, uh, and this is another why it is also important to control what, uh, to understand what controls the size of a cavity is because you can have cancerous cells as well, uh, which lead to the formation, spontaneous formation of the cavity and will invade uh, the tissue. And with that, questions, I will switch to the end and thank all the people uh, involved. Uh, so uh, mostly for uh, uh, all the theoretical work, uh, um, uh, Mathieu leverge Serendour and uh, Jean-Léon Maître uh, for uh, the beautiful collaboration over the years. Thank you very much.